Hello, and welcome to this episode of McGovern Medical Minutes. My name is Randy Gay, and I work in the Office of Communications here at McGovern Medical School at UT Health. In this series, our goal is to share important health information from expert sources here at our school. Today, we're going to talk about social media and how it affects our minds, our relationships, and our society. I'd like to now introduce Dr. Jennifer Barman, Assistant Professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Dr. Barman, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you for having me. So tell me about sort of your expertise in the field and experience with social media in particular. Yeah, social media use is a big hot topic these days. It's really a hot topic. And so it's something that's coming up a lot in working with patients um, in regards to kind of addiction and how it impacts people's lives, um, their productivity, their relationships, and just kind of how they function in their day-to-day -day lives. So a lot of what we hear in the news right now is the negatives about social media and all of the, the downsides and, and the addiction and things like that. And we'll get into all of that, of course. but. Um, I mean, I remember when Facebook first came out and we were all so excited we get to, um, you know, connect with our loved ones and reconnect with people that we haven't talked to for a while. So what, why do we use social media in the first place? So social media has some really great perks to it. So in regards to how we interact with people, especially during the times of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's been so helpful for people to be able to connect with loved ones who they may not have been able to see for many months or even for longer than a year already. So it has that opportunity or it has that perk in regards to how people can relate to each other and stay in touch and reduce loneliness. Um, it also helps us meet new people, right? So dating apps are a big thing right now that people are using that to meet new people from near and far. It helps us be able to stay in touch with people that we may have lost touch with over the years. So old friends, former classmates, people who we would really like to have in our lives but may not be able to because of distance or just life stressors in general, right? Social media gives people an opportunity to also find like-minded individuals, so people who they may not have been able to come across in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, it's an opportunity for people to feel connected to others and particularly Particularly when it comes to marginalized groups, it gives an opportunity to build a community or um, a setting where people can relate to one another, talk to one another, feel connected. So there's a lot of the social elements that social media gives, but it also gives us an opportunity to be on top of news, be on top of entertainment, stay in touch with kind of information. Um, a lot of people get their news these days from social media, right? And so that's something that it gives us as well. We've been all using social media for a long time now and a lot of people are referring to social media addiction we're, we're actually we feel like we're addicted to social media is that is social media addiction a real thing well not fully per the american psychological association it isn't a diagnosis in and of itself but what we are seeing is that social media use can be similar to other addictions so behavioral addiction specifically so things such as like gambling and so while it's not diagnostic, what we are seeing as clinicians and as psychologists is that there's a certain type of dopamine um, that we get out of it, right? We feel good, we feel pleasure when we're um, looking at social media. And particularly things like likes and people watching our stories, that can make us feel good. So because of that, we are seeing that it's kind of similar to other behavioral addictions. It's really interesting. So how does, um, so now, with social media becoming very monetized. It's, it's a, a huge market for especially advertising. And because of that, social media companies have found a way to uh, push out specific content to people using their own algorithms. Um, and that ends up uh, making people see things a certain way. And how, how has that affected people, this particular algorithm or the methods in which um, social media companies are, are monetizing their platforms? So social media algorithms are designed to really promote information, you know, push the eye-catching, the attractive content to you first. It's a little different than something being like time-based. It's more about relevance than whether or not it was recently came online. And so because of that, people are drawn to these things that are exciting for them. You might have seen that you've searched for something online or been to a store, um, a virtual store, and looked for something, and poof, all of a sudden it pops up on your social media feed, right? So it's really being 
the algorithms push this information that is relevant to the individual out. With that though, the problem is that we're seeing the same thing over and over again. We're kind of being inundated with that information. And so that does lead to a lot of things like overspending, impulsive spending, um, when we think of marketing, um, you know, social media influencers as well are being used by companies to be able to promote content and pr promote um, sales. And so that all is something that can affect us as well. So speaking of influencers, a lot of, um, like when I think of an influencer, I think of the, you know, the Instagram model or the, you know, the TikTok dancer or, or whoever that maybe a teenager or a, um, a young adult would, would see and, and compare themselves to and think, oh, they've got this great life. You know, I see all these wonderful pictures of them at a hotel in paradise or whatever, and why can't I have that life or why can't I look like that? How is that affecting um, uh, youth in our society? Well, I would actually argue that it's not just affecting our youth, it's affecting people of all ages, right? Because social media use is not just youth. Um, we often think that things like social media addiction and social media consumption is predominantly with young folks. And that is true to an extent. But we are seeing people of all generations using social media right now. So that constant comparisons that we have, we see these beautiful images, we're seeing these beautiful vacations that people are on, and it's terrific. But then we look at our own lives, that we're at work or that we don't have maybe those opportunities. And it starts taking us down. We start noticing that we're feeling less satisfied with our life. Um, we may be comparing ourselves in terms of our physical appearance. And that can lead to things like self-esteem issues, body image concerns. Um, it can ultimately lead to things like dissatisfaction, sadness, anxiety, hopelessness, even sometimes in the worst case scenarios, things like suicidal thoughts. I've even heard stories from some influencers that would say that they were putting on a facade in order to um, sort of satisfy the brands that were you know, paying for their vacations and essentially paying their salaries to be on social media. And how does that affect maybe someone with aspirations to be an influencer? Um, people that are that, that put on a certain face and a certain um, you know maybe type of clothing or, or take pictures a certain way to make their followers their friends all think that they're great when inside they maybe are suffering from depression. Sure. So the social media use in general is kind of a facade, right? People put on the best pictures on there, the ones that we maybe look the most flattering or that show the best things that are happening in our lives. People tend to skip over the hardships, the setbacks that they experience. We all have those moments where, you know, we might have that flat tire or burn our food while we're cooking. No one's posting a picture of that. We're posting those promotions, the new addition to our family, the new home, the new car, all those really awesome things. But when we maybe aren't feeling great about ourselves, we see that and then it's just another kind of ticket of my life's not where I want it to be, where it should be. And that comparison isn't just in that I wish I was living a better life, but it's sometimes it's this I should be living a better life. Um, why isn't my life that great when everyone else's is? There's been a huge push, I think, in, in recent years, especially about the importance of mental health. And I personally have seen a lot of my friends and acquaintances on, on social media sharing their experiences with mental health and depression and, and seeing a lot of support from other people. Is that a way that we can kind of overcome some of that, uh, uh, that effect that we were talking about um, is actually like using social media in a positive way to connect with people, share our own experiences, hear about their experiences and, and, and overcome some of that? That's one of those pros, one of those benefits that come out of social media, right? So we feel connected to people, we may get support from other people. Hearing people's difficult times in terms of mental health care specifically, or the need for mental health care specifically, that can be something that can come out of social media that's great. So mental health is still unfortunately very much stigmatized in our society and the more people who speak up and social media is a wonderful platform for that the better it is for us all to be able to recognize like you know there everyone goes through moments of hard times everyone goes through struggles and here's some things i can do about it so how does social media affect our productivity that's a huge one. So I work in student counseling services here at UT Health, and that's a topic that comes up 
basically daily with my patients. Um, productivity and the use of social media. Social media, as we mentioned, it's sometimes it's an addiction. It's hard to kind of break that need to check how many likes do we have, how many followers do we have, what else is popping up on social media. And it affects productivity in that way. We're constantly getting notifications, we're getting these dings on our phones, on our smartwatches, on our tablets, on our computers, and we're being inundated by this information. So it's really hard to kind of step away from that and focus on things that we need to be focusing on. So it affects that productivity in that way that it keeps us from being on top of things. If you're in the middle of writing something or talking about something and there's another notification that pops up, it's a lot harder to not look at it than it is to quickly peer over to it and see what it is, what just popped up, what's the most recent news that came. When we talk about impacts on productivity, it reminds me of kind of how it really distracts us from reality. It's sort of like an escape. It's its, it's, its own world, social media. So um, especially during like the pandemic, in some ways, it was it was good to use social media to, to distract from from the real world because there were some pretty bad things going on. But um, I feel like it also may have had an impact on um, people actually disconnecting from reality, which can can then be a bad thing. Um, what have you seen with that? So, as I had mentioned. Social media is kind of the best of everything that we tend to put on social media. So with that, sometimes we get pulled into all the, the good things that people are experiencing and very little of the actual life that we have. Um, so it's easy to slip away from how we are doing, what is around us, what are kind of the ups and downs that we may be going through. When we escape that reality, unfortunately, is the problems that we were facing before we escaped tend to still be there. So what is digital burnout and, and why is it a problem? You might have heard of the term Zoom fatigue, right? That is a form of digital burnout that we have. We're experiencing it because we're working from home or some people are working from home. We are doing everything on our computers. We may have already been doing that before the pandemic, but with the pandemic, it's been a lot more of that. It's virtual learning, it's online learning, it's online shopping, it's online socializing. All of that, at some point, we're exhausted from it all. And then on top of that comes social media. So social media was in the picture way before the pandemic was, right? But with all of the burnout that we're experiencing in all these other areas of our life, it's this thing that takes up another portion of our attention. It takes up another, some of our cognitive resources to be able to focus on it. And it just, it becomes too much for us. I've heard that burnout even, um, specifically digital burnout, can have uh, uh, physical effects, you know, physical stress that, we're, that we feel from, from actually being affected with that. Sure, so things like eye strain is gonna be a big one with that, right? When we're looking at a computer screen day in and day out, not just for the seven, not just for the five days of the work week, but seven days a week we're experiencing it. It doesn't end, right? At the end of the work day, that's when we go to the social media. We watch, shows, we stream information on our computers. All that, it's, it's a lot of information. So physically, we might notice things like eye strain, we might notice posture changes, back pain being a big one with that, um, headaches, and um, details like that. Cool, let's go into uh, cyberbullying. So that's that's a hot topic, especially for parents, but what, what do we mean by cyberbullying? So cyberbullying is bullying that occurs through electronic means. So it's through text messages, social media, anything that kind of is electronically based. It's no different than regular bullying. What's different about it is though that it's happening virtually. So with the virtual nature of it, there's a lot of problems that kind of arise with that. So big one that is different between regular bullying and cyberbullying is the um, is the permanence of it. So whatever you post online stays online. Even if you delete the information, information gets backed up all the time. Screenshotted. Exactly, things get screenshotted. And so it stays pretty permanent. It's also the accessibility of it. So when we think of traditional bullying, oftentimes we think of children and adolescents. Usually happens in school. Well, when they go home, hopefully they're going home to a safe environment where they get some respite from the bullying. They've got people to be around, distractions, things like that. Unfortunately, with cyberbullying, 
it's actually worse once they get home, right? That's when they are able to look at their social media posts. They're seeing all the information. And it's kind of like the torment continues. And it's almost like it gets worse um, once they leave. So it's the permanence that's a big problem. And it's also the accessibility. And it's also the fact that it goes often unnoticed. So in more traditional bullying, people saw it. Maybe another child saw it or another teenager saw it and they spoke up. Maybe another student saw it and spoke up. Maybe the teacher overheard it. Maybe a parent saw it or overheard and they can intervene. And with cyberbullying, it's often invisible to these adults or the people that could speak up, right? So the students that are experiencing the bullying, the cyberbullying, they may not be telling anyone. And instead, it continues to go unnoticed. With accessibility, the problem with that also is it's not just within that small group of people that the bullying is occurring. It's other kids in a school. It's kids from other schools. It's kids from across the city, across the globe, that are unfortunately able to also see the, um, see the cyberbullying when it occurs. That also can be a problem, I imagine, um, when you get outside of the, the, the other kids in the school because then they're anonymous. Right, so if I'm if I'm bullying somebody online and I'm and I'm using whatever even a fake profile if I want to, there's no repercussions that I'm worried about. Right, yeah. So people are kind of hidden behind the safety of the computer screen, unfortunately. And you know sometimes that's a nice thing, being hidden behind the safety of a computer screen. Right, it helps people get out of their comfort zone. As it applies to cyberbullying, though, the problem is so much negative occurs. As you mentioned, people sometimes use fake profiles to cause the bullying. Um, or to bully others and then there's no one that can be linked back to it or no official means of linking it back to that person. And the repercussions of that are not just short term but they're also long term. So short term we might see things like um, social withdrawal, um, being afraid of going to school, being afraid of socializing with others, anxiety, depression, self-esteem issues, suicidality. But long-term as well, given the permanence of information that goes virtual or that is online, the problem with that is future employers may have access to that. College admissions committees may have access to that. Um, so people who make decisions later in life may have access to that too. So that awkward moment that we probably all went through at some point in our life, that gets documented long term. When we talk about cyberbullying, is this only in relation to uh, children? Can this happen to adults as well? Sure, cyberbullying unfortunately occurs in adulthood too. Um, what we see in adulthood is often the idea of trolls, internet trolls. Now that's I know an internet slang term there, but it's this idea of people kind of leaving posts or comments on um, information often to kind of get an emotional reaction from someone else. And so this, these posts may be based in um, fiction, they may be false data, or they may just be something mean or derogatory in nature. And so in adulthood, we're dealing with the trolls now, um, on top of potential, unfortunately, cyberbullying too, in the more traditional means. Yeah, comment sections have really become a, uh, an awful place to, to dive into on, on pretty much any social media platform. It's hard to avoid negative comments. I, I have to stop myself a lot of the time from, from even just looking at them, even on a, a post that I feel like is really nice and I wanted to just go comment on, but then I, my mood is just soured by somebody just, just being mean and, and, and that's kind of a shame. Right, it takes a toll on us. It doesn't feel good, right? Where you might have wanted to leave a positive note, a good note, a good comment. You're gonna maybe have second thoughts. You're like, oh wow, maybe I'm wrong about this. Someone else thinks this is such a horrible idea, a horrible concept, a horrible thing to, um, that I wanna comment on. And so it may distract us. It may make us just not wanna partake in it in a positive way. So it seems kind of, uh, it almost sounds hopeless, but what, what, what can we do about cyberbullying? Can we, can we avoid them? Can we ignore them? So it's so important when we think either cyberbullying or trolls do not respond. That's the big one there. Um, by responding to bullies, and I'm just going to use that term there, bullies, to apply for both, um, it's almost like feeding them. They want to get a rile out of it. And so we want to be sure that we don't comment on it. Um, doing things like changing your settings to have a private account can be helpful to stay safe. Um, report bullying when you see it. You know, that see something, say something that happens or that gets really promoted, 
it also applies online. If you see something, say something. And you can say that as a parent by talking to the school, by reporting it to law enforcement, and report it to law, law enforcement, particularly when it's things like um, child pornography, when it's um, threats of harm. If someone's in danger, report that to law enforcement. Um, also report it to social media websites and lots of social media websites have a safety center. Go to that, um, report it there because we all need to do our part to be able to ensure that this bullying ends. I would imagine if we see somebody that's a victim of bullying as well, potentially at risk of harming themselves or, or, or suicidal thoughts, something we should report. Yes, see something, say something. If you know that someone is being bullied, be a support for them, help them, lead them to the resources. So if someone is having suicidal thoughts, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is gonna be key there. And particularly for the teens and kids in our life, there's also the text line that may be particularly of interest. Um, sometimes we don't know what to say and when we're feeling distressed. And what's nice about the text line is it can let us let, allow our fingers to do the talking. Um, we may be in a setting where we can't, or we don't want someone else overhearing us making that call. So um, the text line could be really helpful in that way. That's great, I didn't know about the text line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a really awesome resource. Yeah, that's great, I didn't know about So that. earlier, really we really talked awesome. about, or we yeah. touched on, um, the fact that social media is so heavily monetized nowadays. Now that in involves people actually spending money while they're on Facebook or Twitter or, or what have you. So how are people spending money on social media and why is it so much easier to spend money through, uh, through online means and, and why do we end up spending too much sometimes? So social media can sometimes lead to online purchases. And that's a big one that we're seeing that people are unfortunately spending way more than they intended to spend um, just because it popped up. As I, we talked about earlier, you know, when we Google search something or search on a website, a retailer for something, all of a sudden it pops up on our social media. And it's almost like, oh, this is fate. They really want me to buy it. Um, so we end up buying more than we intended to. And it's so much easier. It's just one click away. There's no exchange of money and goods in the way it does in a typical traditional brick and mortar store. Um, so it's easier to end up spending way more than you intended to. There's also these microtransactions that happen a lot in things like apps and video games um, where people aren't even thinking about it. It's just an extra dollar that they're spending. It pops up, why not? I'll click it and buy it. Um, with everything being electronic, it's so much easier to overspend, unfortunately, with that. Yeah, we've had this evolution of spending where it used to be, okay, you have physical dollars and physical you know, change that you would exchange and you would have a, a very real understanding of how much money you have available to spend and you would bring that to the store. And then we had credit cards and now we're on our, and then we were on our computer shopping for books on Amazon and now Amazon saves all of our credit card information so we don't even have to go get our card to type our card back in in order to pay it. So uh, it's, yeah, it can really get out of control there, I'm sure. And uh, you mentioned uh, micro transactions in, in, in video games and, and things like that. And I think that's so interesting because, yeah, people end up um, with you spending just a little bit at a time. And I know the stories of, of kids spending their parents' money on a, on a game that they'll never even remember playing when they're, you know, 20 years old or something and uh, spend thousands of dollars. And, and it's incredible. It can definitely get out of control. Yeah, it's such a thoughtless experience, right? All that information is saved, our credit card information is saved, and it's just a click, and something happens after that, right? A few days later, with Amazon, two days later, you might get your Prime delivery. Um, with an app or with a video game, it's instantaneous. It's this instant gratification that unfortunately comes with it. How do we avoid that? Are there some tricks maybe that we can, uh, or some tips that we could take to, to kind of limit that or, or restrictions we can put on ourselves to, to try to keep it to a minimum? So setting a budget for ourselves for how much we want to allot, um, for how much we want to allocate to online spending in a month. Um, keeping track of that too. So whether that's keeping track of it with like a memo on your phone or through a formal means like Excel document, but keeping track of your expenditure so that you know how much you've spent already this month. Um, and also deleting the credit card numbers from your, from your 
Google Chrome or from your web browser. I think it's so much easier to just click buy than getting up, going to your wallet or your purse, taking out the credit card and then um, buying something. So trying to give yourself a few extra steps in that way can reduce that impulsive shopping that unfortunately happens. I know I get so frustrated whenever I'm on an app that loses track of my, uh, my credit card information and I have to go up and, and get my card to type it back in, but then it does make you think twice about like, you know, do I really need to spend, you know, $50 on DoorDash or should I go and, and pick it up myself? <laughs> Right, it's an extra step, that one small extra step can make all the difference between an impulsive buy and not. What are some other uh, major concerns and dangers of uh, social media that we're seeing? The one big thing is human trafficking. Social media has become a platform for human trafficking to occur. So that is something that we're seeing, unfortunately, um, a lot right now. With social media use, there's also a lot of information that, or rather I should say misinformation that gets carried through. And sometimes it's even through people that we trust, people who we thought were credible sources. We see that information and we may start believing it. That may not always be factual information. Unfortunately also, as we had talked about earlier, social media gives people community. Sometimes that community may not be a healthy community or helpful community for them to have. And so it's not uncommon that we're seeing people going down the, so to say, rabbit hole of things like conspiracy theories or extremist groups, unfortunately, because of social media. One of the major reasons that social media has become so um, either addictive or just uh, commonplace or hard to avoid is the accessibility of it, right? It's on our phones now. When it first came out, this was, you know, it was MySpace and it was Facebook and it was all on our computers when we got home from school or from work. And, but now it's on our phones and the notifications, the little push notifications and the dings, you have to look at it. If I feel my, my phone vibrate in my pocket, I have to take it out and I have to, I have to look, I feel like. So how do, we, how do we stop that? How do we limit it? How do we stop ourselves from, from forcing ourselves to look at it every time we get a notification or, um, or pulling ourselves away from it for a little bit. We're definitely inundated by social media. It's on our phones, on our tablets, on our computers, on our smart watches. No matter where we turn, there's social media as well. And while social media has some amazing things that it's given us, the problem with it is that it does also have some limits. And the goal of this video is not to make social media into a horrible thing that we should all stop using. It's about building a healthy relationship. So good place to start, turning off notifications. So making sure that it's not that ding every few minutes that you might have um, that takes your mind off of what you were doing. So being sure that you're maybe delinking the notifications from your phone to your tablet or to your computer or to your smartwatch. So giving yourself a little bit of a break from social media and not being tempted as much by it throughout the course of your day. That'll help with things like productivity. It'll help with well-being as well. Some things that can be helpful is to track the amount of social media use you have. Most social media apps these days have a feature on there that you can see how much time you're spending using the app. If it's a little bit of time, that may be okay for you. If you're noticing that you're using up a quarter of your day or half your day um, on social media, that's when it's probably become excessive and may need to be cut back on. So certain things like, um, as we discussed, the notifications, um, other things that can be helpful is to take a cleanse. So taking a break from social media for a few days, few weeks, few months if you need to um, can be helpful. So doing that by deactivating your account or even just deleting the app from your phone can also reduce that impulsive checking of social media. How about with our kids? So how, um, I mean, I know it's, it's, we can similarly limit our children's use of social media. Um, I know there's some child lock services and things like that. Um, how do we help our kids as they grow up build a healthy relationship with social media while many of their friends may be using it a lot and um, they may be worried about fitting in? So healthy habits that we can teach our kids right now are oftentimes carried on throughout one's life, right? Like healthy eating habits, healthy drinking habits, healthy social media habits as well. So being sure that children are not over um, posting information on there. Um, does that mean they shouldn't have a so social media account? I'll let that be up to the parents to decide whether or not they should have that. But if you choose to let your kids have it, um, being sure that you're monitoring what they're using 
using social media for, how they're using it, what they're posting, and how much time they're spending on social media. So those things like parental controls can be helpful with that, of course, but even just being there as much as you can, um, checking in on them and how they're using social media. Some additional ways to build a healthy relationship with social media is to be conscious of your social media presence. Um, so being conscious of what you're posting and how you're posting it. So posting things that are meaningful to you in some way can be a nice way to cherish that memory. Um, but making sure that you're not kind of searching for the likes or hunting the likes, counting the likes, checking back in regularly for the likes. So reducing that can reduce some of that social media use as well. Being sure that you don't have your phone near you while you're trying to sleep. Um, a big time suck before bed or if you wake up in the middle of the night is checking your phone. Not only do we know things like the blue light can be really harmful for our sleep habits, but also it leads us to getting on social media and sometimes that becomes excessive or a time suck. And so um, putting your phone across the room can be helpful in reducing that need or that feeling to check. Yeah, it's interesting to think that something digital like that can have a physical effect on us, but losing sleep over social media can be a, a real problem. And we know it's become a very pervasive problem, unfortunately. So earlier we talked about misinformation. So how do we avoid misinformation and make sure that we are getting our news and information from reliable sources? So being sure that you're looking at where the link is leading you to. Um, so being sure that you're checking websites that are credible and not just maybe f coming from an uncredible source. Um, things like that. So if you're seeing someone post something on social media before reposting it, check the facts. Double check that what you're posting actually is valid and credible. So with all of the you know crazy influencer lifestyles and um, like chasing and things like that, how do we maintain our sense of self and our positive self-image? It's important to be mindful of what you're consuming by social media. And with that, that not all information on there may be accurate or at least not maybe comprehensive. And so being aware of that, that the information you're getting on there may not be an accurate reflection of things um, is helpful. Also, count your own accomplishments, the good things that you're experiencing in your own life. Um, it's easy to kind of fall into a place of, oh, my life sucks. It's not as great as what I'm seeing on social media. But probably there's still things to be, um, to be glad about. So being sure that you are looking at your own accomplishments, being sure that you're looking at the, your own good things that are happening in your life and having gratitude. Learning to love yourself is important with this. Also being mindful of the fact that um, with social media, sometimes information is altered, right? Pictures are altered, um, they're photoshopped, they may not be an accurate reflection of what life really is like. So just being aware of that and um, shutting down social media, taking a break from social media whenever you notice that it's become harder and harder to differentiate between the two. Yeah, some things that, sometimes the great things in our life that, that we can reflect on and be proud of or be happy about aren't necessarily things that we're going to be able to post on social media or that, or that makes sense to. And so maybe being able to internalize that and to be um, uh, grateful for those things uh, uh, can help. I mean. yeah. Yeah, not everything needs to be put online um, for us to be appreciative of it. So do some self-reflection and see what it is that you are grateful for in your life. Something that's really important to my family is quality time and something that my wife has told me on occasion is uh, to put my phone away at the dinner table. So um, is there something that you want to say about uh, being present in real life, not just our presence on social media? Absolutely. I think your wife is definitely onto something there. It's another way that we can kind of build a healthier relationship with social media is to be present here and now. So being sure to kind of put your phone away. Um, if you're in a conversation, flip the phone over that you're not seeing every pop up, every notification as it comes in. Um, just being present in a conversation can be already a better way of having social media in your life.